From the time the first steam train carried passengers from Stockton to Darlington 123 years earlier, our railway network had grown. Main lines, branch lines, sidings, stations, junctions, an iron motorway. Everywhere, smoke and steam. Now only a few working engines remain, out of place, out of time. The last evening stars of a fading past. The last steam train ran a scheduled service for British Rail in 1968. The new diesels were brighter, cleaner and speedier. The romance was gone, but the memory of the steam age continued to attract passengers for a ride. run steam railways flourish from the Dart Valley Light Railway to the North York Moors Historical Trust. Passengers have become enthusiasts. Enthusiasts have become engine drivers. And by public demand, steam trains are still running the main railway lines, like this one from Leeds to the city of York. York, a competitive railway city since the 1840s. And since September 1975, the home of the National Railway Museum, snatched from London despite howls of protest by the former keeper of civil and mechanical engineering at London's Science Museum, John van Riemsdyk. There was, of course, a railway museum at Clapham. It was admirably done on a shoestring. It only attracted about 150,000 visitors a year, and it wasn't railway connected. This location was quite unsatisfactory from the point of view of the Science Museum, when the Science Museum became responsible for that collection, so we had to find another place. Personally, I was much in favour of York, York being a city which had tourist attractions already, but not too many, so that people would come to York and they would look at the Minster and the Castle Museum and so on, and then they'd say, what shall we look at next? I used to say, we will get a million visitors a year in this museum. And people used to laugh at me, saying, well, you only got 150,000 at Clapham, and that was in London. They never mind, we'll get a million. And of course, in the first year, we got something like two million. It's 10 in the morning, and doors open to another 3,000 or so each day, seven days a week. In the first 10 years, 13 million people have marveled at a world of memories. What brings them all here? Assistant Keeper of the Museum, Peter Simmons. We had a survey done by the official government survey department, and they came up with a number of very interesting uh, results. One of the things was that we were top on the list from the point of view of a family visit, and this very much shows that we are not an aloof an elitist organisation that some museums are sometimes criticised for. But what is the public getting at the museum? Keeper of the collection, Dr John Coyley. We inherited this very rich collection in 75. We hope by our efforts in the past 10 years we've improved the balance, we've widened its attraction, and uh, that is the way we, we hope to go in the future. So I think they get very good value. and. Uh, I think uh, the, the number of visitors we've had reflects this. We have the responsibilities of conservation, collecting and displaying, hopefully uh, in an attractive and informative way so that the visitors enjoy coming to see us. The museum is heir to everything British Rail owns, from platform tickets to King's Cross Station. Checking the value of every new exhibit to a growing display, Head of Education and Research, David Jenkinson. 
fairly recently, a letter dropped in my desk to indicate that they were changing whole Paragon Station over and would we like some old stained glass windows? So we popped across to Hull and had a good look uh, to see what we could see. I think perhaps this is the best piece over here. This piece is uh, still complete. It's such an inside out of uh, the Bomber Station buffet. I think this is the best piece. There is one other piece. That's yeah, but complete. the, the other ones the that are around, there are, there are at least three are this size, and I can see a couple of smaller ones as well. There's five pieces in total. Five in total. One or two of them are a little bit damaged, though, as you've probably seen. Well, I think we can kick that one around later, yeah, can't we? I mean, the important thing to let our friends from the railways know is whether we're going to take them back to York yes. or not, and it seems to me that we well, should. It was another piece of detective work which discovered this stunning vehicle. Well, this was a real find. This is very much an ordinary man's railway carriage. It's a third-class carriage. We found it in a siding in Bedford in a rather dilapidated condition, and I realised that it was, in fact, a sleeping car. So we rewove the original pattern of the upholstery because we knew what uh, we were looking for and we could get a sample. And the clue to the fact that it's a sleeping car are rather subtle. I'm actually sitting on one of them because really this isn't a seat at all, it's a mattress. And on my left, instead of the occasional table, you've got a little set of steps that will get you up to the top bunk. Where's the top bunk? Right behind me. And to set it up, you need a key. And the key was unlocked. And down comes the bunk into its supports, which are very strong because after all, it is a railway carriage. And then the mattress that I was sitting on earlier is lifted up put on top of the bunk here, you could hire a pillow or a rug for a few shillings extra to the normal third class fare. The fact is, of course, that railways were not all about technology. The vehicles were technical enough, but once you got within the walls of the, of the vehicle, as it were, you found things like fine woodwork, splendid upholstery, and that extended well beyond the boundaries of the railway lines itself into the buildings, the refreshment rooms and the hotels. Nothing is overlooked, certainly not glorious reminders of the days when railway catering had a touch more style than dehydrated coffee in a plastic cup. To try and show the public something of the infinite variety of what one might call more artistic objects, we like to put them on show in some of our old carriages and in the showcases. Here, for instance, we've got a rather nice coffee pot from the old London and Northwestern Railway, marked with the railway that made it. In front of it, there's a rather splendid cake server and a pair of grape scissors immediately in front of that. China, too, received its attention. Quite a lot of it was used for all and sundry, but in this particular vehicle, we've got some genuine Royal Worcester, which is blue-banded and marked for special use on the Royal Trains. Talking of Royal Trains, of course, the Royal Family were great users of the railway, and one of our particular treasures is some most wonderful engraved glass that was provided for Queen Victoria's use in Perth waiting room. And we've an absolute mass of more material of this nature over in our silver vaults. But the museum is more than a treasure house. Behind the public displays, it has built up a range of special services. Dr. Coyley again. In addition to the more obvious exhibits, we are able uh, to provide uh, library services through a small reading room, and this is proving increasingly popular. We also provide uh, photographic prints, copies of mechanical engineering drawings, and uh, we can offer advice and information about the history of the museum. And the history of our railways at work. This is the only known colour film of a streamlined train which was running from London to Glasgow just before the war. The film archives are full of the often impressive, though short-lived examples of our railway story, now alive only on celluloid. Most of the signalling equipment is housed in a shed well away from the main museum, but some of it has been dusted down and made to work again. It's the museum's idea to let the visitor get a feel, as well as a sight of history. There we go. 
This Edwardian dining coach, number 76, was built at the turn of the century. It was restored at a cost of around £40,000 in 1979. The public display is only a fraction of the collection. Behind locked doors lies much more. Shed after shed is filled with the unlikely discoveries and discards of the past. Some are restored, others wait for attention. The craftsman's work is so meticulous that it's often hard to tell the real exhibit from the reproduction. Well, here's an awful lot about Pullmans in this modern day of railway preservation. And this is the National Railway Museum's contribution to the scene. It's called Topaz, and it's over 70 years old, an example of the real prime of rail travel. The interesting thing about it is that the interior furnishings are less than a year old. Apart from the walls, which are original, and one or two of the brass fittings, everything else you can see, whether it be tables, chairs, table lamps, or anything else, is a tribute to the modern-day restorer's craft in an attempt on the part of the museum to recreate the travelling environment of the 20s, something of the gracious spirit of travel, as opposed to the technological aspect of the way in which the wheels turn and the mechanism works. In the first ten years, the museum spent more than a million pounds on restoration and repair. But on a bleak siding, the least glamorous reminders of our railway's past. These are the trucks made redundant by speed freight and containerization. This one carried gunpowder. Another was used as a snow plough. Now they wait for time and money, and space in the main exhibition area, which so far has found little room for freight wagons. And inside another building stands a cross-section of railway history. Engines and bath chairs, wheelchairs and stretchers, pumps and cattle loaders, wagons and pushers, trolleys, handcarts, trailers and covered trucks. History waiting patiently for its time to come again. For some, that moment has arrived, not in a museum display, but at work again. There's no doubting the popularity of working steam. Steam specials attract passengers in thousands. Some of the best steam engines are owned by the museum. Precious relics they might be, but the public wants to see them trundling along the rails again. The museum has argued that you don't take the best china on a picnic, but the demand is there and the passengers are ready to pay. It's a dilemma for the museum curators, but not for the enthusiasts. They know what they want to see. Quite honestly, you walk around a museum and I just get brought to tears, you know, looking at static exhibits. Uh, there's nothing better than to be able to stand at the line side or even travel behind the steam train. Should be running all the time. The whole thing, because uh, it's good for the engines, it uh, attracts a lot of tourists, you know. It's just, um, I, it's just totally in motion, actually. I was brought up to be accustomed to steam locomotives, and I suppose it's a real dose of nostalgia for me. I think also that steam appeals to all the senses. There's something quite remarkable about the steam locomotive. This engine, rescued from Minehead in 1976, is the Duchess of Hamilton. It's cost the museum over £48,000 to restore to full working order. The cost of a non-working restoration would have been less than half that figure. The money saved could have been spent on the next coach, wagon or engine in the queue. Even some of the museum's staff find their loyalties tested. 
torn between steaming and non-steaming. Chief engineer of the National Railway Museum is John Bellwood. As an ex-railwayman, I believe that locomotives were intended to be workhorses and it was right and proper that they should operate rather than be stuffed and mounted in the museum. Uh, that's one side of the story. The other side is, of course, that museums are all about conservation. And there's no doubt about it, every time they operate, they are put somewhat at risk. It's a calculated risk, as far as we are concerned, but they are put at risk. So it's, uh, it's the museum side saying no, and the railway locomotive engineer saying yes. And, uh, you know, you're dealing with a unique example, and there is a, an argument that you should minimise any risks at all to something that's unique and part of our railway heritage. One name in our railway heritage probably stands out above all others, Mallard. She holds the world speed record for a steam locomotive, 126 miles an hour, achieved on a run near Peterborough in 1938. And ever since she retired in 1963, enthusiasts have wanted her back at work. Now she's being rebuilt at the museum, and the money for her restoration is coming from an unusual source, the ratepayers of Scarborough. Tourism officer David Elliott. Mallard will run to Scarborough once a year uh, in the next seven years, but it will also run uh, in other parts of the country, and while it's doing that, it will bear the name Scarborough uh, on the engine and indeed elsewhere. The total cost over the seven years will be 35,000. The money will be spent entirely on the restoration of Mallard. It will be in the original blue, um, as far as possible to how it was when it was made. Uh, any plaques or other information that is put on containing the name Scarborough will be done very tastefully and in no way to damage the original concept of the engine. When Mallard runs again, she'll be looking her best, just as she did almost 50 years ago. But ironically, she's not the only example of this design that's been preserved. Six others remain, so there'll always be plenty of chances to see a Mallard-type locomotive in action. There had to be a last steam locomotive, and here she is, built in 1960. She's named Evening Star, and she's still at work, but for how much longer? British Railways have said that they envisage steam operation to 1990 with a probable extension to 1992, but the scale of operations will gradually reduce up to that time as fewer and fewer skilled crews or maintenance staff or technicians are available. We're a dying race, we steam people, I suppose. The difficulty we are in, finding the right compromise between conservation and operation, and that's what it's all about. If the demand is for live steaming, how does the museum plan to respond in the next 10 years? Keeper John Coyley. The next uh, years, um, we'll see quite a lot of expansion. Uh, the, we've been planning this for the first 10 years and we're standing here in what has been our store or the reserve collection building. We're hoping to open this 1987 to visitors to give them a feel of the whole spirit of travel by train. Uh, the present museum, of course, has dealt with the, the technological history of railways. But uh, railways have a lot of romance about them and we felt that was lacking and it's that uh, element we want to inject into this new exhibition. How do you transfer these romantic images into an exhibition hall? 
this particular platform, for example, will be our royal parade, if I can put it that way. Um, to my right, we will have the Edwardian Royal Train with an appropriate locomotive. On my left, there will be Queen Victoria's Saloon with another appropriate locomotive. Behind that, the very green engine that you see behind me will be attached not just to one teak carriage, as it is at the moment, but we hope to get another Royal Saloon to go with it. And, and the whole spacious promenade will, will, we think, come to life. At the moment, most of our Royal Saloons are, are, are tucked away, beautifully restored, but hidden away in a rather humdrum shed just, just off this building. Well, that's not good enough for all these beautiful objects. The detective work will go on. This is another unique sequence of film. It was found in hundreds of pieces in a forgotten old storeroom. When joined together, it showed scenes of a North Devon narrow gauge railway running between the coastal towns of Linton and Barnstable. That railway hasn't run for half a century. This discovery was followed by another. A rotting hulk of a carriage was found in a field in Devon and it was one of the very carriages used on the railway and shown in the film. When the carriage was viewed by the museum staff, it was little more than a heap of rubbish. After some negotiation, it was bought for £3,000. It now needs at least £20,000 spending on it to restore it to its former glory. With thousands of exhibits on display and the prospect of thousands more to come, how does the museum see its role in the next decade? It's our job, collectively as a museum, to see that this whole bag of tricks, as it were, goes on to our successors at least as good as we received it and preferably better. And this is where the dilemma comes in. If you run them now, which pleases the present generation, do you put them at the sort of risk that the future generations are going to object to? I think we're going to take an increasingly hard line with this, that um, one of our overall responsibilities as a national museum is to see that these uh, wonderfully unique objects are here in 50 or 100 years' time. If we uh, spend too much time just preparing locomotives to work excursion trains, then the, the same people involved there have to leave other restoration and conservation projects and this means that those slow down and with all the plans we have for the future I think we must concentrate on doing what we can do best and are perhaps in a unique position to do and leave to others things that they're better suited for. So it seems that the museum will almost certainly pull out of the steam special business. That means the enthusiasts and trippers will have to rely on the private preservation societies for riding around. Little boys and girls who want to be drivers of APTs and HSTs will have to come to York to see the legends that delighted generations before them. More than 15 million visitors are expected in the next 10 years at York's National Railway Museum. So for these evening stars, it's far from the end of the line.